And I am very happy to introduce Lori Kurzenich. She is an Associate Extension Specialist with MSU and an Insect Diagnostician at Scudder Diagnostic Lab. And we're very happy to have her here um, speaking about residential insect management. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to join you tonight. And I was too bad I can't join you in person, but I know there are probably people from other counties and other areas that can join us via webinar. I am a, a, an extension specialist and my background is spiders. I really love spiders and I know people that are joining in today, some of you might not like spiders, but I have quite a bit of enthusiasm for them and I have to be careful when I talk about indoor pests because I really enjoy having some of these come into my home. <laughs> so I know that's not why you're here. You're not looking to bring more insects in, but I am going to talk about a, a lot of different insects here. The most common ones that, that I have coming into the house and then I get reported here through, through uh, my samples and, and questions. Just a few things I, I, I that just about daily insects that we encounter. We, we see arthropods and insects in our daily lives, usually when we have an issue with insects and when people, they're, 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 they draw the line when they come into the house. It's okay if they're outside, but when they come into the home, that's when they don't want them there. But they're coming in to seek shelter and protection, sometimes in the summer, but mostly in the fall and trying to get away from some of these, these harsh winters. And I'm actually shocked that we don't have a ton of insects and spiders that are in our house all the time. It's just, you'd think that they'd all want to try to find a cozy place to spend the winter. After they're in the house, they are mostly, especially the ones that come in in the fall, they're kind of in a semi-dormant state or hibernation state. And most do not reproduce inside. So it might look like you have a ton of them in the house. It might look like you're getting more in the house but most of them are not reproducing at all. There's just a few more coming in than you would like to have. Uh, most do not survive the winter in our homes. So we have a lot of things like cluster flies, box elder bugs that, that, that might not make it the whole winter. They might wake up like right now. I saw some box elder bugs in my house this week and they are waking up uh, and either waking up from inside the house or they're waking up outside of uh, our, um, the Bozeman area and, and trying to come back in. The best thing to think about, it was a little too late now, it, but if you have some that came in this fall, make your house inhospitable on the outside before and, and uh, get those screens ready. You'll hear me talk about a lot of what we call physical controls to try to keep them from coming in the house in the first place. And I wanted to mention too, if you have questions, please, please, uh, you can, um, I could open up my chat, chat box here or, or Adrian can um, uh, let me know that there's a question. So I'm going to talk about the insects in, in, in four different ways. I'm going to talk about the permanent residents. These are ones that, that actually do reproduce in the home. So we do have a few that, that like to be in our homes year round. We have summer visitors. Some of them don't actually make them in the house, but they're on our porch. And I know Adrian wanted me to talk a little bit about wasps and um, they are mostly don't make it in the house, but some do. And then most of our, our visitors and ones that were uh, our invaders are our fall visitors. Uh, and then we have some other invaders that I hope that you don't have to encounter, but I get questions on these all the time and we have issues uh, with bed bugs and clothes moths and, and um, sometimes ants. So we have uh, for our permanent residents, one of the biggest insect issues that, that I get questions on are carpet beetles and almost everybody has a few of these in your home. It doesn't matter if you're super clean. Uh, they are an insect that, that has done really well in the urban environment. That's because they have a quite a wide feeding range. We call them scavengers. They feed on feathers, dead birds, birds' nests, dry carcasses, grains, cereals, carpeting, upholstered furniture, wool blankets, books, pet food, pet fur, and they can even chew some holes in clothing. So it is the, the, the larval stage or the immature stage. We see that in the picture in the bottom here, the carpet beetle immature. And all, we have several different species of carpet beetles. The one picture on the top is the larder beetle, which is probably one of our largest carpet beetles, which is about a quarter of an inch long. But most of them, uh, the, the immature stages, even for the different species, all kind of look the same. They, 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 uh, they're kind of a hairy little larva 
Um, they are harmless to humans, but they, um, they, they, they can be uh, quite irritating in the home. The adults will fly and they're often found on windowsills. They, they will try to get out. The adults will to go and feed on, uh, they like spirea plants. They like to feed on the pollen and nectar. So most controls for the carpet beetles are physical. That means really getting out the vacuum and disposing of any infested materials that you can. And when I say get out the vacuum, uh, vacuum around carpet edges, baseboards, and behind furniture. So pull the, the couch away and get back in those areas that you haven't vacuumed in in a while. And I get a lot of carpet beetle questions and a lot of issues from people that have cabins that have been left unattended for several months or people or homes that have, have been abandoned for, for a little while. It allows them to really build up they can get into your pantry too. So I'm not saying that if you have these, that they're gonna definitely infest your pantry, but, but definitely check your stored grains and that rice that you haven't opened up for, for two years. Look in some of those, those boxes to see if you have, might have some carpet beetles. If you can't find the source, then, then maybe you could use some, some sticky traps. Those are glue traps that you just put on the floor. You could rip off the, the top part of that and it's just a, a glue trap and, and you can find out where they're walking around. Spiders mostly are just passing through, and I, I'm saying that all year round we could have just a random spider just in the house. But we do have a couple that that I would consider permanent residents, and the one that I see the most is the false widow. It's in a genus called Steatoda. It's a cousin of the black widow. But that means it's in the same family. Uh, they hang upside down in their webs. They're brown. They've got some patterns on their abdomen, and um, and and they will reproduce in the home. So you can put them in the garage. That's a good way to, to get rid of them if you, if you don't want to kill them, um, if you want to relocate them, but they might make it back into the house. Um, the other one that we have is the cellar spider. This is a spider with really long legs, will tend to shake in its web when you get really close to it. And uh, completely harmless, but it also gets confused. A lot of people think this is the brown recluse and, and we don't have that here in the state. But these are two that you'll see in the home. And, and I just wanna say right off the bat that spider bites are, are pretty rare. They only bite if threatened or if trapped in their, their and, and usually if they're trapped in your clothing or shoes. But they only, uh, so if you do have, if you have a garage and you store some shoes or something like that in the garage, I always tell people to shake out their shoes because they can be in places like that. And same with clothes too. The only spider that we have that's of medical importance that we, that's dangerous here in Montana is the black widow. And we do not have the brown recluse here and there's a lot of misinformation with the brown recluse. Uh, and I will talk about the black widow on the next slide because they, they can be a permanent resident as well. If you're trying to get rid of spiders, cut them up and put them in the garage or outside. I, I've trained a lot of friends to do this. I know a lot of people aren't comfortable doing this, but I've, I've gotten a lot of people over to the other side to appreciate the spiders and just put them outside in the garage. They are doing a service when they're in your house. They are, they are eating pests and they're, they're killing flies. They're doing a lot of, they're eating a lot of pest insects that you probably wouldn't want there. Uh, you could also use sticky traps for, for spiders. They, they don't hang out in groups. They're solitary, but sticky traps can be good for, for some of our fall, uh, fall, spider invaders. The vacuum is also your friend. And as a last resort, you could do a perimeter foundation chemical spray on the outside of your house. Uh, the problem is, is that you have to, this can work a little bit, but, but uh, they have to contact the pesticide. So we call that a residual. So there'll be a residual from the pesticide that, that remains on the siding of the building. They will crawl. Uh, the spiders have to contact that pesticide in order for it to kill them. So uh, they're pretty mobile. They're not in, in, in the Chemicals don't always reach the, the spiders. Black widows are common in Montana. If you, I don't know if anybody uh, has seen them in their house. I used to have a lot more of them in Colorado. I had I had black widows in my garage every year. They, uh, we have the Western widow here, Latrojectus hesperus, and they are very reclusive. That's why you don't see them very often. Um, I have a friend that that works in irrigation systems, and he he finds black widows in irrigation boxes every year when he goes out, and he does and he works on people's lawns. So this is how I get a lot of my black widow pets because Dan will trap them for me. 
They exhibit something called sexual dimorphism, and uh, that means that the male and the female look completely different. You can see this picture of the male on the bottom. He is kind of brown and marbled, about a quarter of the size of the female. The female is the only one that turns jet black, and she is hangs upside down on her web as well. They all have the red hourglass. Uh, the male has the venom as well, but he is very unlikely to encounter humans. You hardly ever see the males. They look completely different. Uh, it is, the bite is really, the reclusive. I could probably handle my, my black widow, probably wouldn't do anything to me, but I wouldn't recommend that. And, but the bite is no joke. It is, it is really, it has a neurotoxin. It causes a severe muscle cramping, sweating. It's supposed to be an unbelievably painful experience. And it is uh, very, very uncommon to get a bite, but it is, it, it, it's not something that you ever wanna, wanna deal with. <clears throat> chat box just to see if anybody has any questions. I won't let me. Open my chat box. No questions yet, Lori. Okay, you'll let me know then, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. Sometimes it gives me a problem. I'm not. So now I'm going to move on to some of our summer visitors, and we have a lot of summer visitors. If you're someone that sits out on the porch and reads, I'm sure you've seen quite a bit of summer visitors that we have. I wanted to talk a little bit about wasps. They are the, we have a lot of wasps here in Montana. We have both social wasps and solitary wasps, and our social wasps are um, uh, are uh, mostly bald-faced hornets, aerial yellow jackets. Western yamble jackets and paper wasps. And we have, um, these are the, the European paper wasps and the Western yellow jacket look, look pretty similar and the bald faced hornet is kind of black with a, a whitish abdomen. So uh, they are typically not aggressive unless their nest is disturbed and uh, except for the Western yellow jacket, it can be quite aggressive, especially late in the summer when it's going after sugary substances or anything that while you're sitting out on your deck, anything is good for the Western yellow jacket. Most of our stings that we encounter come from the Western Yellow Jacket. If, if you are a hobby beekeeper, you probably know, I probably have gotten stung by the Western Yellow Jacket when you're harvesting your honey. It is, I mean, I, I, that's why I gave up beekeeping because I couldn't stand getting stung by the Western Yellow Jackets. They all feed on insects and, and some of them do feed on sugary substances later in the summer. And they make paper-like nests annually in the spring from, from wood materials. And the last point I, I really wanted to stress is the nests are abandoned in, in late summer for all of these wasps that are mentioned here. So they are, if you have a problem with the wasps, sometimes you don't see the nest, but, but only the, fer, the, the, the um, some of the female, the queens will, uh, they'll produce some fertilized queens and these queens will overwinter and the, the current queen of that nest will die and all the workers within that nest will die. And so will the drones, the male, the, uh, the male wasp. So uh, that nest is completely abandoned. And so you will, if you have a big bald faced hornet nest or you have a European paper wasp nest, that is not gonna be, they're not gonna go back to that the following year. So a little bit about wasp management and it is really hard to control some of these larger nests uh, later in the summer. So this big bald faced hornet nest that you see on the top picture there, that is about the size of a basketball at the end of the summer. I mean, it, to me, it's a work of art. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. But if you if you went up there and tried to control that nest at this time of year, you would get stung like crazy and they will sting multiple times. So there could be hundreds to thousands in this nest. If you ever, ever find one of these, you should cut it open and look inside and see how many layers of cells there are in there. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, these wasps can fly up to a thousand yards and so this nest can be quite a distance away so if you do have problems with any of these wasps that might not be on your property at all uh, you will be able to, to spot the bald faced hornet nest probably on your property um, if it's if it's there in the european paper wasp nest uh, i find a lot of these on my deck and i'm kind of on the underneath my deck and so you will be able to see those as well, but you will probably will never see a Western yellow jacket nest because they usually take over rodent burrows and they're subterranean or they could be in your wall voids. So take a look in the spring. If you've had issues with, with wasps and you don't want them around, take, an issue, take a look around early in the spring, uh, maybe in, in early summer before these nests get to huge, huge basketball size nests. 
And then there are traps available for the Western yellow jacket. You get these at a hardware store or a garden store and they say uh, yellow jacket traps. They, they are only for the Western yellow jacket and, and some other common, some other closely related species that we don't really have in Montana. So they're not gonna trap a bald-faced hornet. They're not gonna trap a European paper wasp. But if you get these out, in the spring, I always try to get mine out by Memorial Day, unless I get calls earlier that they're out earlier. Uh, I put my trap out to try to trap the queens in, in late May, and, and it's very effective uh, and trying to reduce any sort of nests and visiting Western yellow jackets around the property. There are a lot of active nests around that can be controlled with, with, uh, with wasp sprays, so there are um, any we call these pyrethroids. Some of the active ingredients uh, are they're all they're all pyrethroids, and um, they are they will they will take down a nest um, and at, at any stage. But it I mean you have to use quite a bit of it, and, and it's get better to get them in the earlier when the uh, when the nests are smaller. So apply late in the evening, early morning, or on cool rainy days if you do want to get rid of the nest and you have the opportunity to to reach that nest. I try to do it when the, the wasps are not active. After a couple of serious frosts, the wasps will all be dead and you can knock down the paper nests. So whatever is left behind, they're not gonna go back in there. And, and uh, if you don't want it around, you could just knock it down. We have a quish, question. Um, yes. Where does the queen overwinter? Pretty, it depends on the wasps, but um, I found bald-faced hornets are were trying to get into my siding. So uh, they will be either in, in the leaf litter or in, in the siding. The, uh, same, with, same with the Western yellow jackets, they will be close by in, in a protected site. So I guess they all kind of, uh, they all kind of will choose a protected area, a leaf litter kind of around the, the area where the nest is. They will be probably close by again. If, if they, they were on your property. So our next, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Asian giant hornet, otherwise known as the murder hornet, because this is a, a wasp that has been found in the United States and I'm sure everybody heard about it. And I know Adrian's gotten some questions, so I wanted to address the murder hornet. This is the largest hornet species that we have in, in the world. And if you look at the palm of your hand, it's a, an inch and a half to two inches long. This wasp will take up your almost your entire palm of your hand. It is huge. So uh, some Canadian experts confirmed that there were three sightings of the Asian giant hornet in, in August of 2019 in an island in British Columbia. This is the first time they've been, they were detected in, in North America. Following those sightings in Canada, uh, and they found in Washington, they found they found two sightings in December of 2019. And they did not find a nest associated with the with these sightings. So they weren't sure what was going on and they weren't sure if they were going to overwinter. But uh, this summer they found out that they did overwinter and they found nests. Um, they found queens and they tried to track, they actually tried to they put tracking devices on on some of the queens. They put, they had some issues with that, but they did actually find nest, a nest, and they did their first ever eradication of a nest in, in the US in, in, uh, in Washington. So as of right now, it is not known to be in Montana, and, but we are really concerned about this as, as a potential pest of, of our uh, commercial honeybees. So they, are, they, they nest in the ground, they feed on other insects for food, just, just like all the other wasps that we have. And they, they actually are not aggressive. They usually don't attack humans unless they're provoked. Um, and if you have some time, you should search around on YouTube for, the, I, I forget who the, um, the person is that, that did some of the, he tested, a, he tried to get an Asian giant hornet to sting him and he had to really try to get it to sting him. But I mean, he, like his arm was completely red. He said, I mean, he looked like he was gonna cry. So it is not a joke if you get a, a sting from this either, but um, we don't expect this to be an issue kind of in the garden garden, but we are concerned that it could be a potential issue for our honeybee industry. So they can, they can destroy a hive within several hours of detection. So they'll kill all the adult bees in the hive, and then they'll consume the honeybee immatures or larvae for their own, for their own young, to raise their own young. So Montana Department of Agriculture is looking out for this 
I know a lot of uh, a lot of people throughout the state of Montana have submitted me pictures. So I'll show you some of the ones that that, that have come up as the lookalikes. We have the the elm saw fly, uh, the the pigeon tremex, which is a wood wasp, and also the western cicada killer. Especially in eastern Montana, we've had a, had a lot of sightings of the western cicada killer. These are all really large wasps, and the elm saw fly is more of a wasp relative, but. But we, uh, I appreciate when people are looking out for, for the, the Asian giant hornet, the murder hornet. And uh, because we have so many, uh, we, we do have a lot of commercial beekeepers here in Montana, and we do send our hives to Washington, Oregon, and California. So it, there is a potential for this to, to come back to our colonies and, and our hives. So. Uh, Please let me know if you see anything like this and, and, you, and you're concerned. I'd, I'd be happy to, to look at any pictures or samples that you have. <laughs> Another summer visitor that we have are, we have weevils and we have several different species of, of, of they're called root weevils. And the, uh, we have, they come in our homes anywhere from April through November. And what the one on the top, it's one of our smallest, the picture on the top is one of our smallest weevils. It's about two and a half millimeters. And we don't know very much about their, their biology at all. And we have another species that's pretty similar in size that has just come in in buckets sometimes into people's homes. And, and we don't really know what host it's feeding on. But they're really harmless to humans and structures. But uh, the adults, the characteristic damage from adults is in this picture here that you see in the middle. They, they, they do some notching along leaf margins. So they're chewing along the leaves and they're creating these little margins. And that's usually a sign that you have root weevils on that plant. You see this quite a bit on lilac and peony. And, um, and we're not seeing, it's the immature stage of the beetle, the larvae that are feeding on the plant roots. But we haven't seen too much in the way of damage of what it's doing to the plants. They're just more of a nuisance coming into the home. So every, every summer we get strawberry root weevils, we get black pine weevils, and then these smaller weevils on the top can come in all year round. And um, they, they look like they kind of play dead a little bit. They're harmless. Um, they cannot fly, but they sure can, they sure can build up in numbers. So this is one where you really have to look at some of your physical controls. Install door sweeps. Door sweeps are huge if you're having big issues with, with pests coming into the home. So put these on the, the at the base of your exterior doors, especially seal all cracks in the siding and try to caulk that area where the foundation and the siding meet. That is a big area of introduction. Um, I noticed this week that that the box elder bugs are coming in through my sliding glass door, and it's probably a little too late for me to caulk that area. But but I know where they're coming in now. Um, vacuum up the adults, and then you can do try to do a chemical treatment early in the fall. Uh, the base of all doors and windows should be treated and, and you could do more of a foundation spray along the soil and, and up the foundation wall. So uh, sometimes it's really hard to figure out how they're coming in, but just know that they're not reproducing in the home and, 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 um, and most of the time they're not gonna, they're not gonna make it through the, the winter. Springtails are, uh, we call them springtails because they have this structure on their underside. A lot of springtails do, they call it a furcula, which allows them to, to spring up and kind of, uh, kind of jump. They look like, they kind of look like fleas. You can have thousands of these present in a small area of the yard and they are really good for the soil. They break down organic matter and return, return nutrients to the soil. And they are great, a great food source for a lot of our ground beneficials like spiders and ground beetles. But when we have those 80, 90 degree days where we haven't had rain for, for several weeks, they're looking for some moisture. So they will leave, sometimes leave the lawn and they'll make, try to make their way into your house and they're looking for standing water or some sort of leak that you might have around the house. Um, they also, we have a group called snow fleas that uh, they, um, those March days where we're, we're starting to get into the 40s, we've got snow melting on our lawn. Uh, it might look like you have a bunch of dirt on the snow and you go back and look at it, you see some insects jumping around. Those are probably snow fleas. If you do end up having a few of these, if you have a greenhouse, they sometimes can cause some damage to, to your, uh, some of your 
seedlings. So you do have to watch out a little bit, but there isn't very much evidence of damage that they've done that they can do to a lot of greenhouse plants. So managed leaks and standing water around the house, um, it is good to know that they're only gonna be around for a week or so. They're super irritating sometimes and they might be everywhere, but they will either die or return to the soil. And it's not gonna be worth your while for these insects to, to use any insecticides because most of them are, are resistant. <clears throat> So this year we had a really big issue with, we, we have an issue with these quite, a, quite often, but this year was really bad. So we have uh, a major false chinch bug invasion for probably most of August and September. And they're coming into buildings and turf grass in, in search of moisture and humidity. And they're about um, uh, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch long. And the aggregations can be in the hundreds at certain times on plants and on buildings. And I had some really frustrated people call me this year because they could not get rid of them. Uh, they feed on weeds uh, such as flixweed, plants in the mustard family, and turf, kochia, and, and pigweed. And the reason why we probably are having more of an issue with false chinch bugs is they feed on, um, they feed on canola. They're not an economic pest of canola, but we are starting to see more canola production in our state. And, and, I, and, and once the canola was harvested, this is when they were moving into people's homes and they were getting into cupboards. They were all on the outside of the building. I mean, just swarming the outside of people's siding. So a uh, very frustrating situation. It's the invasion again for this one is only temporary. They should die on their own within a week or so. But during that time, it is, it, I mean, they're, they're, they're everywhere and I think there's, there's some debate about whether uh, the, the canola producer was responsible for taking care of them. And, and the answer is no. I mean, if, they, if they're not, um, if you're living in an agricultural area and that's just, if, if the, the pests have moved on from, from that area, it's not, it's not their responsibility to take care of them, especially if, if it's not profitable for them to, to treat them with insecticides. You can try to reduce the watering to your lawn to, to try to make it um, not, not look so attractive. And again, try to seal up any cracks and crevices or holes in the screens. So they are also another pest that, that they're resistant to a lot of insecticides. So you could try to spray, but I had a couple of people that were frustrated this year that were spraying the, their siding in the outside of their house on a daily basis. And, and you actually have to follow the label. So it's against the law to spray something more than the label says. And, and I think you're only supposed to spray most of these pesticides for, for perimeter sprays uh, every seven to 10 days. So you gotta really watch what you're doing there. And, um, and sometimes you're making the situation just a little bit worse. Some of our other summer visitors, and I'm just gonna talk about some of the spiders passing through. We do get uh, several different spider species, but, but um, we get wolf spiders, funnel web spiders, crab spiders, uh, ground spiders, and jumping spiders that enter our homes. They probably look a little bit lost. They just want to. They just want to pass on through. They don't know what they're doing in your house or how they got there, but they're 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 trying to get out. Um, the the wolf spider on on the right there, the hog hogna carolinensis. That's probably one of our biggest spiders that we have here in Montana, and it is uh, it is scary to people when it's found in the home. And but I've seen saw a few of them this year. And they are totally harmless, but they're huge. And um, I had someone drop one off as a pet this year. So, so uh, I, if um, not your not your favorite visitor, but one of my favorite pets. <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our fall visitors, and um, uh, one of our biggest and most uh, one of our biggest visitors that's here every year is box elder bugs. They feed on the seeds of female box elder trees and, uh, and other trees such as maples and sometimes ash. Uh, they're most abundant in uh, hot dry summers and they will travel as far as two miles away. So sometimes it's hard to figure out if you don't have any box elder trees or maple trees why they're coming into your yard. But this is one that, that can stain fabric. So you gotta really be careful if you're smashing these in your house. And you can try to spray some insecticidal soaps or soapy mixtures on the outside of the walls. And I really just, uh, I, I use the vacuum quite a bit for, for these guys if, if I see a lot of them building up on the side of my house. And um, 
they're, they're really on the south and southwest facing walls and they're completely harmless, but they are trying to get in. We also have a bunch of, uh, I'm gonna be talking about a few seed bugs here. So we have a tuxedo bug. This is an introduced species from Europe. It likes to feed on plants of the mint and figwort families. And this is another pest like the false chinch bug. When you see it, it's, I mean, it's in the dozens to, to, um, to hundreds. And the one thing that I've found that's been pretty consistent with this pest is they seem to like homes or buildings that are on, uh, that's surrounded by weedy areas, like an abandoned pasture or something of that sort. But uh, pockets of infestations, I've seen them in several counties in the state, but they're not around every year. But um, it is difficult to try to figure out where they're coming, coming from. They also like to hide in firewood too. So most of the controls for this bug are, are physical and, um, and trying to uh, improve your screening or sealing the cracks. And you can try a foundation spray if you see them congregating, uh, but this is one that, that, that's pretty mobile, a little bit hard to capture with any sort of uh, perimeter spray. And Adrian, I do have the pesticide questions coming up in a couple of minutes here. The, the next one that we have uh, is the Western conifer seed bug, and they feed on the seeds of pine and Douglas fir trees. So they're often mistaken for, uh, and the, this is another one that doesn't come in every year, but I just want to mention that this is often mistaken for, for the kissing bug species that can vector Chagas disease. So if you see this assassin bug to the left, um, that, is, that is what this is often confused with. And assassin bugs can deliver a really powerful bite, and uh, apparently one of the uh, one of, the, one of the worst bites that you can have. It's, it's supposed to be uh, supposed to be pretty painful. We do not have the kissing bug species that, that vector Chagas disease in the state. And we do have cases of Chagas disease, but these are people that have traveled to other areas. And um, we might get those species at some point, but right now we don't have those. But uh, this will be, uh, if you look on the internet, we have something, if you have a Western conifer seed bug, this will be your biggest, uh, this, is, this will be the insect that I'll be most confused with. So these look really awkward when they come into the house, they fly around, they don't know what they're doing. They are, and, and um, vacuum is your friend if you don't want these in your house. And um, usually you just get a few of them at a time. They, they do look like they, uh, that, that they don't belong there and they look pretty awkward. <laughs> so we do have, this time of year, we have a lot of late summer and early fall. Uh, we have, it's really normal for spiders to enter buildings and homes. And like I said, I'm surprised we don't have a lot more coming in. Uh, the one that we have in Western and Central Montana that is, that is pretty consistent, except for this past year, is the hobo spider. In Missoula and Flathead areas, we get dozens of the hobo spiders coming in every week from August through November. And the first the males come in and then the females come in and, and then they don't spend the rest of the time in the house and they don't reproduce in the house. So there's, uh, I, I mean, I, I used to get calls constantly from August through November last year. I think I had 10 homeless spiders. So something is going on, either they're, they're not coming into the house anymore or there's a competitive species that has, has taken care of the homeless spiders. But, but I, I, it, maybe this is our last, last deal with homeless spiders. But there's a lot of misinformation about them. They, their venom does not cause necrosis or tissue death in humans. And they're also not known to be naturally aggressive. So the misinformation came out several years ago and they've been trying to correct a lot of that information, take down some, um, some misinformation on the CDC website. But you can trap a lot of these hobo spiders with, with sticky traps. And you could also use a, a vacuum on a lot of these hobo spiders. They are very, very large. So I think it, they're pretty intimidating. So now it's time for, uh, for just a pesticide credit question. So name one home invading insect or other arthropod and place your answer in the chat box. Make sure you put it to the host. Yes. So for those of you who need pesticide credits, make sure you answer that question. And if you haven't already put your license number in, include that with it. All right, we've got hobo spiders, box elder bug, might be our only 
need to. You can continue if you want. I think those are our only two. Okay. Another fall visitor, and this one can get really frustrating too, that comes into our homes in search of overrunning sites is the cluster fly. And it looks almost exactly like a house fly, but if you have the ability to look at it under the microscope, it has these golden hairs on its second segment, the thorax. But you could have, I have a few of these every year and it, it doesn't really bother me, but I've had people call me that have hundreds, if not thousands of them coming into their attic. And I mean, it is to the point where they want to move out of their house. And um, it is very frustrating. They're not, they're, they're just more of a nuisance, but I mean, you know what it's like when you have, um, when you're trying to do some work in your, in your office and you just have insects everywhere. So uh, they, they will come in and, and, and like to be in the upper part of the house. They're an interesting fly because they're not passive garbage or decaying organic matter. So usually flies will lay their eggs in, in, um, in garbage sources or some sort of decaying organic matter. And then you just get rid of the source and that'll help take care of the fly. These flies are parasites of earthworms. So they lay their eggs in earthworms and uh, they parasitize the earthworms and then the, the fly eggs develop within these earthworms. So they're a little bit more difficult to control and, um, and, and people that have major issues with cluster flies really have to think about sealing cracks and entry points and that you can focus on the upper parts of your house. Uh, it is important if you do have these infestations to try to get some sort of pyrethroid insecticide or some sort of insecticide on the outside of your building to try to keep them from coming in because they will congregate before they come in and you will see masses of them on the outside. Once they're in the house, they're pretty difficult to control and, and they, will, they will go through a resting state for a while, but then, uh, then they'll wake up and, and sometimes on, on warm days like we have right now. So uh, depending on where you are, it, it just, it's really, they, they can get really frustrating, but if you just have a few, um, I wouldn't worry about it as much, but try to take care of the ones that, that, that are bothering you. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions before I move on here? Nothing in the chat. Nothing in the chat? Another fall visitor is uh, our, we have garden millipedes and they are something that we love to have around on a normal basis because they feed on decaying plant material, kind of like the springtails and they bring these nutrients back to the soil. So we call them detritivores and they are beneficial. They, uh, but in the fall and after big rain events, we have, they will mass migrate into buildings and, and they will end up in your basement or um, you know, your first level, wherever, um, wherever they might be coming in. The good thing about these millipedes is that they only survive for a day, a day or two in the home without moisture. They're very dependent on, um, on moisture to survive. So there's nothing in the home usually that they can go to for, for moisture. So they can't really tolerate any dry conditions. Uh, so you can uh, roll up and moisten a newspaper and put it where they're congregating if you find them out there on the soil. So you can uh, throw away that newspaper when you see a bunch of them in that area. Give them somewhere to hide. And so that's what the, the newspaper will do. And then you can throw that away afterwards. You could also sprinkle a product called diatomaceous earth around the foundation and they will, they will come across this diatomaceous earth and it's a desiccant and, and it'll end up drying out their, their, um, their exoskeleton and the outside of their body. And um, so this, you would have to reapply the diatomaceous earth after, after rain events, but it's a good way to get rid of the millipedes. So I'm gonna spend the last few minutes here talking about some of our other invaders. And if anybody has questions at the end, we'll talk about some of your invaders because it, everybody has the opportunity to have something come in. And I know sometimes it's really frustrating when you can't get rid of some of the things that keep coming in. I hope that bed bugs don't become one of your invaders. And, and I, I see bed bugs on a yearly, yearly basis. Um, they, are, they are in every county and every in every area of the United States. So everybody has bed bugs, has the opportunity to bring bed bugs into their house, but, um, but it's, they're, they're pretty good hitchhikers. 
but they're also not, there's no real, real relationship between bed bugs and cleanliness. So they were used to be associated with poor hygiene and, um, and things of that sort. But now uh, we do find bed bugs more often associated with, with areas that have a high turnover of residents and like apartment buildings, uh, hotels, and things of that sort. But any, any of us that travel a lot can bring them back and um, they can, they are found inside homes and buildings and they will reside in any crack or crevice where a credit card could fit. And they could be on any item where, where people rest. So it is, it, it, it is pretty rare for, for them to, to um, if, you're, if you're just have one or two and they hitchhike, um, it depends on what stage that the bed bugs are at, but, but you have the ability to bring them back to your house. And if you catch it early, it's not a big deal at all. Uh, they don't transmit any diseases, but kind of gives you a little bit of the heebie-jeebies when you have a bed bug issue. And um, we do, I'd be happy, we have a lot of misidentifications of bed bugs as well. So uh, I'd be happy to look at any pictures that you might have and uh, in a sample if you wanted to send one in, if you think you have bed bugs. Uh, we also have a closely related species called the bat bug. And the bat bug uh, looks almost exactly like a bed bug, but the the source and control would be different. So you would uh, really have to try to keep the bats from coming into your house um, in the attic area. Uh, but bed bugs are, you can manage them. You just have to try to catch them early. And I'm not trying to scare people, but, but um, if you do travel a lot, uh, check around the, your hotel bed and make sure, um, don't put your suitcase on your bed and make sure that you're doing your bed bug checks uh, and, and your luggage and stuff when you get home. Another invader that I just got a call about this today, and I, and I wanted to mention too, especially if we have any hunters that are that are tuning in today, we have a, a two different types of clothes moths that can come into our homes, and when they're present, they can do quite a bit of damage. And some of the really bad damage I've seen has has been very depressing with hunters that have had mounts on their on their walls for for many years in these prized possessions, and uh, um, they've had a clothes moth infestation that. I mean, they'll, these clothes moths will, will feed on, on any type of fur or wool or any, any animal products. And it's the caterpillars that are feeding on, uh, feeding on all, these, um, all these wool and animal products. But um, these are really small moths. They can, uh, they can go through uh, several different generations. They could also be in a state of arrested development, depending on what type of conditions they're in the house. So, they might be in your house for a little while, kind of in, a, in, a, in the egg stage, and then you bring a humidifier in, and all of a sudden they're just super excited and will reproduce. But um, it's really important to try to catch clothes moths early. And this woman, this case that I had this morning, she said that she just found some clothes moths in one of her um, one of her chests, and she had a bunch of wool sweaters in there, and, and she doesn't know how the clothes moths got in there, but uh, the, the clothes moths were, were eating away at her sweaters. So you can you, you can control these moths uh, with and you can you can monitor them with closed trap or with uh, closed moth traps, which you can get at the at the garden store or at um, a hardware store, and they will trap um, just the two species of closed moths that are damaging to our um, a lot of our materials. Really try to dispose of any infested materials and um, dry clean or freeze any of your sweaters that you can for, for uh, 48 to 72 hours to try to kill all stages of the moth. And then <clears throat> you could take those to the dry cleaner afterwards, or you could, um, and then you could also dry clean your, your wool rugs. This is one situation where, where um, I normally don't recommend bug bombs because they, they don't really work very well for spiders and a lot of our, a lot of our home invading arthropods. But if you have a really heavy infestation of clothes moths and, you, and it's in an area where you don't have, and you know, you're not eating um, and you can't, can't control the, you know, they've got these mounted specimens on the wall that you might have to move to uh, use a bug bomb that will release a residual spray and, and will kill all stages of, of the clothes moths. So these can be pretty devastating. Uh, this is also really devastating for museum uh, specimens too. So if you're out and you see a cool feather or something like that, you're out hunting, um, <laughs> anything you can bring back that you can bring back some, any sort of animal product that has fur on it and, and you might be bringing in clothes moths to your house. So this is just something to keep an eye on and it's not, um, you can't control that if you catch them early. 
We've got a question here. Um, yep. Are they look quite small, like a small miller? They're they're about. Uh, that's a good question. I'd say they're about a third of the size of a miller moth, and they are they are like a an iridescent gold color. They're very distinctive looking. They're very small, and and I think when you see one, you'll probably see several of them. So you, there are, we have a lot of really small moths that come into the house. So if it's not really like a golden brown uh, color, I, I wouldn't be super concerned. Um, I have small moths in my house quite a bit and, and, I, and, and I don't know, um, it, I've never had a closed moth in my house, but I have had other species. So yeah, I think if you, if you know what a Miller moth looks like, it's about a third of the size of a Miller moth. Thank you. My last insect that I wanted to talk about, uh, a group of insects are the ants. And uh, I, I don't feel like I've done ants justice in my time here because I feel like uh, most of them that come into the house, they, they are just, they, they are kind of lost and they don't need to be in there. And, uh, and most ants are totally harmless and they're not doing anything. And um, the ones that come in the house are, are field ants. We do have carpenter ants that can make it into the house, but um, we have a, a thief ants, odorous ants, and feral ants that, that usually, um, the last three ants that I mentioned are, are following some sort of food source. So I've gotten these when I've left out wet cat food, or if I've, uh, if I've left cookies, cookie crumbs in the cookie jar. So I usually could trace it back to something like that. And then I, I it, it's typically pretty easy to get rid of them by um, kind of washing down the surface or the, the trail that they leave when they are, um, they're following a certain trail. If you wash that down with soapy water, that's a good way to get rid of the ants. Uh, field ants are, are we also call them thatching ants. And they are, they usually, you'll have one or two that enter the house. And these, that's an ant that comes in and it's kind of lost and doesn't really know what it's doing. Um, that is totally harmless. Uh, it doesn't have a stinger, so it can't hurt you. And um, usually those, I just kind of flick them back outside. We also have um, carpenter ants can make it into your house. And that is often a sign that you have some sort of decaying wood or compromised wood in the house. So um, they usually have a, a colony outside. They start their colony outside and then they, they call them satellite colonies and they'll come into the house and they will travel along electrical wires. And, um, and they are coming in, uh, usually it's a sign that you have a leak or something that's going on and um, they do not eat wood like termites, but they will push wood. Uh, you'll, you'll see little, little piles of sawdust around. And, um, and structurally, you have to have a lot of carpenter ants in the house to have structural damage over time, but it is a concern. And I am more than happy to look at any ants that you might want to send in. I, carpenter ants and field ants look really similar. So I think it's important to try to figure out which one you might have. And I often can't do that from pictures unless they're really detailed pictures. So um, there are, uh, uh, you know, there are ways to get rid of all ants um, and, and ant bait stations, those little stations that they look like little um, tuna cans that you could get at the hardware store. They have a bait that'll track the ants, and they also have a, a poison inside, uh, inside these, inside the can, and they will bring that poison back to the nest. They are very clean animals, and they will spread that poison to all their their nest mates. And the goal with trying to get rid of ants is to kill the queen. So if you can't kill the queen, then uh, then you, um, you you still have the colony going. So it it is very it, it you, you can take care of ants. But sometimes it takes several weeks uh, when you have, especially if you have those ant bait stations, it takes a long time for that, that to, uh, to get to the queen. So usually when you remove the source or attractant, that's a good way to get rid of them. But, um, but most of the ants are totally harmless. Um, and and uh, we do have issues with them when they're kind of, we have a bunch in our lawn. And, uh, but most of the time the ants are just kind of a secondary thing. Uh, and with the carpenter ants being the ones that we have to keep an eye on. And with that, I will, I will take any questions that you might have. And I know that you probably have had a lot of different types of insects in, in your house, or maybe some of the ones that, that I've chatted about today, if you have further questions. 
This is my contact information. I'm happy to look at anything, uh, any samples or answer any questions along the way um, during the year. We're open all year round to take samples. And um, we really love it when you um, uh, work with, with your, your fabulous extension agent too. And um, we can actually, uh, we, we help the extension agents if, if they need further assistance with, with uh, identifications too. So, but you can contact me anytime. All right, and while we wait for some questions to come in, um, I just dropped a link in the chat for an evaluation. If you guys could uh, fill that out, let us know what we're doing right or wrong. <laughs> Always helpful. Um, so far, no questions. Wait 30 seconds or so. The awkward silence. All righty, well, I'm not seeing anything coming in. Um, so thank you, Lori, so much. And thank you. Oh, hold on. In regards to the killer hornet, how can you early detect them? Uh, you know, that's a that's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, I, I think they're more of a late summer test. So um, I don't know exactly what they are doing for, for traps, for what Montana Department of Ag is doing for traps, but um, I don't know. I don't, I, I think it would be getting the traps out at the, at, at the right time. And I'm not sure, I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what that time is. So um, that would be the key to try to trap the queens early. And, and I'm actually not sure if they have we call it a, a pheromone lure, chemical lure that will track them. Um, for the wasps, it's actually not, um, it's uh, the one that we have just attracts the Western yellow jacket. So I'm not sure how they're trapping them. So good question, but I don't know, know the answer to that. Because it looks like he needs a bigger bug assault gun. <laughs> yeah, I guess the tracking device that they, they put on the, the, the murder hornet uh, was, the first one fell off and the second one, I think the, 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 the hornet destroyed it. So they had a really hard time trying to try to keep that tracking device on the insect to try to try to find out where the nest was. Wow. Alrighty. I don't see any more coming in, so I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>